on behalf of the Sonoma State University Holocaust Studies Department and the Alliance of the Holocaust. Um, my own involvement here in this area has been with the Alliance of the Holocaust and uh, its ESSER organizations. And I can only remember when I came to uh, Sonoma County 25 years ago that it was already in operation. There were two different organizations that were commemorating the Holocaust through, they called it the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial. And the Petaluma Jewish Council had one memorial in Katati at the Women's Club, the Petaluma Jewish Cultural Clubs had another memorial, and about 10 years ago they merged and from this developed this wonderful activity, series of lectures that you have here. I want to tell you that next week, Peter Hoffman, from McGill University, Montreal, will uh, speak on the resistance to the Holocaust in Germany from 1933 to 1945, and that will be next week. What actually happened at the Holocaust, Reverend Douglas Henneke, our speaker this afternoon, will tell us more about it. Reverend Hadeke is a native of San Francisco. He uh, has a degree in psychology from S Fresno State. He has his divinity degree from the San Francisco Seminary that's in San Anselmo. He took his first full-time preaching job as a pastor to students in Sacramento at the Fremont Presbyterian Church. And from there he went to the University of Oregon in Eugene, where he was the past students at the Westminster Foundation. Westminster Foundation is all over the country. It's uh, the Presbyterian Foundation for Students at the Universities. And then about eight years ago, he came to Tiburon and became the pastor of the Presbyterian Church in Tiburon. He comes to his interest in people at least 20 years He's received many awards. He was active in ACLU. He and uh, Rabbi Sheldon Lewis went to Russia, the Soviet Union, oh, about five, six ago. Spent a lot of time studying about the dissidents, meeting with them, often putting their own security on the line because of them. He's received the Myrtle Wood Hadassah Award. He's been on the faculties of several colleges to give lectures and series. We have a man who's devoted, I would say, a good part of his life to making sure that he has done his part in working for the dispossessed, not only out of this country, but for the dispossessed in this country. Racial equality has been a concern of his. Gay rights have been a concern of his. Juvenile rights have been a concern of his. Aside from his full-time pastorship and all the other work that he does. He is the vice chairman of the Marin Community Foundation, which is a successor to the famous Buck Fund. 
It is my pleasure to introduce Reverend Douglas Henneke. Give me a minute to figure this piece of machinery. That's what you want? Professor Steiner and Bob Harris, colleagues and friends, I'm pleased to be here. I owe you an apology first that uh, it has taken so long to respond uh, and actually be here with you. I have followed the very fine work that has been done by the Institute and by this school, and it's just a, a great pleasure to, to participate in this. And what you are doing is a model for many of us in other places. And I hope that we're able to be faithful in replicating some of the very fine work that you do. Standing here, I have no sense of whether you can hear me in the back or if I need to raise my voice. Am I right? Okay. Begin with a quote. Our central focus was memory, our own and that of the victim. During a time of unprecedented evil and suffering, that was the Holocaust. An era we must remember not only because of the dead, it is too late for them. Not only because of the survivors, it may be too late for them as well. Our remembering is an act of generosity aimed at saving men and women from apathy to, if not from evil itself. With those words, spoken to the Presidential Commission on the Holocaust, Elie Wiesel, then chairperson of the council, set the parameters for the study and work of that era. Memory, victims, survivors, rescuers, and the future. On January the 30th, 1933, with Adolf Hitler's ascension to the office of Reich Chancellor, or do we look back at the anti-Jewish policies of the Greco-Roman world? For example, uh, the fate of Jews under Alexander, Alexander the Great, who at his request settled in Alexandria, but who in turn were attacked. Or do we look to the Greco-Roman wars of 66 to 70 in the Common Era? following which Josephus recorded that nearly one and a quarter million Jews were either murdered or taken captives. Many of those who were taken captive were forced to assimilate to that society. Or do we begin with the public burning of all Jewish books, a burning which took May the 10th, 1933? Or do we reflect on the triumphalist attitude of Christianity and the subsequent teachings of contempt that permeated the history of Christianity from the patristic period to the Re Reformation and beyond that. Do we begin by looking at the promulgation of the blatantly anti-Jewish Nuremberg laws beginning on September the 15th, 1935? These laws, if you are not familiar with them, restricted Reich citizenship to those persons who were of German or related blood, and then only by certificate if the question of German blood or related blood was in doubt. The Nuremberg Laws also contained a series of clauses that severely limited the rights of marriage, or the right to marriage, work relations, housing, economic security, and the internal movement of Jewish people in the German state. And later, in a subsequent section, defined Jewish in such a way that future laws could more effectively isolate and maintain the power of the state over those people so that they could be moved about the society. Or, 
do we look to the late 19th and early 20th century and to the circulation of the infamous forgery called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which presented an alleged plot by the Jews of the world to dominate the world. For that matter, should we look back even farther to the accusations, demented as they were by Martin Luther, that the Jews were planning the destruction of the Gentile world. In 1546, Luther was preaching from various pulpits, demanding that Jews be expelled from Germany because they planned a genocide, though that word was not language at that time. He used a rough equivalent of genocide, that the Jews be expelled from Germany because they were planning a genocide against the Gentile world. Between the world wars, the protocols became a similar mandate for expulsion and genocide. In fact, some of the suggestions from 1546 made by Luther in his sermons that the appropriate way to handle the Jews to expropriate their property expel them from the communities, take them to the edges of town, and if necessary, kill them, became unofficial formulations for some of the German laws that led up to the Nazi destruction of European Jewry. I have cited a few of the many wide-ranging historical antecedents in order to make the point that the Holocaust did not sp to life de novo, out of nothing with the rise to power of the National Socialists in 1933, or with the establishment of Auschwitz in 1940. The roots of the Holocaust are deeply set in the soil of human history. And one cannot simply begin at the rise to power, the ascent of, of Adolf Hitler as Reich Chancellor. One has to go way back in, in history, in the history of the church, the church's feeling that it had succeeded Judaism, this triumphalist teaching. And perhaps even before then, to the incidents that I have uh, mentioned. In October 1938, the property of German Jews began to be Aryanized under a procedural code permitted the government to expropriate such businesses and personal property as it wished and to sell that property to certifiable Germans of Aryan descent. Herman Graby, who until two years ago lived in San Francisco, Herman Graby was uh, an engineer in Germany. His profession was structural engineering. And Graby was among that group of German Aryan, certifiably Aryan citizens who were invited to a public meeting to talk about and to potentially uh, purchase some of the property being expropriated from Jewish uh, merchants. One of his own suppliers turned out to be one of the people whose property had been expropriated. The man, a very honest man, had admitted at the demand of the brown shirts, uh, had submitted to them an inventory which set the value of his business inventory at 800,000 Reich marks. And he had received only 8,000. And he was accused of having inflated the value of his property, and when he protested, he disappeared, and that was in 1934 or 35. Gravy went to this meeting to protest what had happened to his colleague, and because of his protest, he was jailed for six months in a local institution because he had been, and I quote, duped by the Jews. Well, those expropriation appropriation laws pulled the National Socialists to move in and undermine the economic stability of the Jewish communities in Germany. Within that same month, 17,000 Polish Jews in Germany were expelled from that nation, simply rounded up and sent away. 
back to Poland, taken to the border area. Some were allowed to return, very few. Some slipped back, but the majority were forced back into Poland. That included the parents of one Herschel Greenspan. He was a student in Paris, and his response to all of what was going on in Germany was to devise in his own mind an assassination plot. He would go to the German embassy in Paris. He would seek out the ambassador and assassinate protest. In fact, he succeeded in assassinating the embassy secretary, Ernst von Roth. And the Nazi propaganda machine under Joseph Goebbels seized on the assassination as a means of enraging the populace. The story of the assassination was carefully manipulated in the press, and what ensued was the night of broken glass. The Reich High Command, in response to the night of broken glass, decided to vigorously prosecute a different policy, one of forced relocation, bureaucratic pressure, legislative enactment, and then terror against the Jewish people. It was felt that that kind of an approach would be much more successful on the inter than random violent acts brought against the Jewish people in the streets. Of course, as you will well recall, uh, the activities on uh, the night of broken glass were just incredible acts of violence against Jewish property, synagogues, and Jewish persons. Reinhard Heydrich was designated to be the one who would implement and oversee the policies that I've just described with his subordinates Adolf Eichmann and Heinrich Himmler. At this point, the initial preparations had begun for what would be called in 1941 the final solution. In September 1939, the German regional government in occupied Poland began establishing ghettos for Jews. And in November of that year, Jews were required for the first time in that nation to wear either yellow armbands, yellow patches, or yellow stars. A year later, in 1940, Himmler decreed the establishment of Auschwitz, first as a labor camp and then in secret documents for the purposes of exterminations. At the same time, the Warsaw Ghetto was sealed. Now, it had become the policy of the German, German government to round up the Jewish populations and put them in ghettos. Uh, at this point, the Warsaw Ghetto is closed. In 1940, Goering designates Heydrich as the one to become the designer, if you are an architect, forgive me for the careless use, but to become the architect of the final solution, the one who would design it, build it, and implement it. It was at this same time that the first of the extermination camps began to do the work of exterminating the Jewish population. At the same time, mobile killing units, Einsatzgruppen, were deployed throughout the Ukrainian region. Now, the Einsatzgruppen were an interesting brand of uh, military. They operated without the usual constraints of a military unit. They were allowed to move into a region in advance of uh, a formal military uh, movement, and their sole task would be to round up all of the Jewish people in the area. Those who would not be used for forced labor, labor columns, were to be destroyed. And of course, the work of the, the mobile killing units uh, at first was quite successful. But you have to remember that the mobile killing unit members were simply taking large groups of Jewish people, forcing them or on digging mass graves and then killing them one person at a time. And that whole function 
began to demoralize the line units that were involved in, in such a destruction. It is significant to note that one of the mobile killing units was led by a German military officer who was an ordained Lutheran minister and who found that the work of the mobile killing units, his unit D, was consistent with uh, what he believed to be appropriate as a uh, member of the Christian clergy. On January 20th, 1942, the Wannsee Conference began uh, to develop a systematic plan to eliminate 11 million Jews on the European continent in both Central and Eastern Europe. Three months of that conference, three major concentration camps were opened as extermination camps. One of them, Treblinka, had a very interesting history, and I want to just tell you a little bit about it in order to illustrate some of the reality of that horror. I mean, we're talking about all of this in the very abstract form of, uh, of a historical port, and, and that's rather offensive when you consider the magnitude of what happened to the people who went to these camps. Franz Stengel was an Austrian traffic cop, if you will, and he began to move through the ranks of the party and was identified as a person of unusual loyalty and obedience. And he was designated to become the commandant of Treblinka. Stengel went to Treblinka and opened what had been a work camp, a punishment-oriented concentration or work camp. <coughs> He had originally been designated to, to do other work, but when he got there, submarine engines delivered to that site by the right command. And the purpose was to connect the engines to large uh, sheet metal units, buildings, truck, uh, trailer units, and to begin exterminating Jewish people by means of carbon monoxide poisoning. So groups of people would be stuffed into these makeshift chambers, the engines would be started, and people would be put to death by means of, of, of a very cruel kind of, of poisoning. Stengel found that the whole system wasn't working properly, that he could not meet the demands of the offices in Berlin overseeing his work, that his quotas were never being met, the machinery would break down, that people who were advised, ad, ad involved in the process were, were becoming demoralized by it. There had to be something else, some other way. So Stengel brought a group of physicians from Berlin to the work site and, and demanded of them, what, what can we do that will make this more effective? The physicians, presumably people who had uh, subscribed to at least the equivalent of a Hippocratic Oath to preserve life, put their work in the service of the death at Stengel's bequest. They told Stengel that, uh, that people were not absorbing the carbon monoxide poison quickly enough, and that on arrival at the camp, they should be forced to run what later came to be called the Avenue of Blood. They should run the length, and when they arrive at the site of the extermination vans, the um, makeshift vans, that, that their heart pressure, their heart rate, their body uh, pressures would absorb the poison faster. As soon as they arrived, put them in, have the motors going, and kill them. And of course the physicians were right. Now people arrived at the camp, they panicked, they were forced to undress, forced to run the length, which was a distance of at least a kilometer, and then those who fell were shot, those who tried to get away were killed, and Stengel had, had mastered this with the assistance of the medical community. Now, it, it became even more difficult for him because people would arrive 
and they would know immediately what was going on. So Stangl had a group of his officers and prison build a, a building at the end of the railroad line. And the building looked like a railroad station. And they put flowers under the windows and around, and they had a, a train schedule made up listing European health spas and other destinations. And then all of the trees in the area, if you ever go there, you'll see that most of the pine trees are very stunted. They're very under duress uh, with the military, their machine guns, their handguns, their rifles, to undress, to run the length, and were put to death. Shortly after the opening of uh, Treblinka, there was, within a year, there was a major uprising that led to the closing of Treblinka. There's an interesting sub-story that goes with that. Several hundred people, 90, 200 people, Jews, escaped from the camp. And most of them were killed by farmers and partisans in the area. Stengel was caught. And, and the book about his life, written by a British journalist, is a very important one. If you've not read it, I commend it to you. It is entitled, Into That Darkness, the story of Franz Stang. People there began to resist what was happening with the people who had fenced them in, who maintained them, meaning the militia and the Nazi government. In April of that year, the Allies convened the Bermuda Conference. The purpose of the Bermuda Conference was to determine what pathway the Allied governments could take in order to write about the, the history of that era, most notably, While Six Million Died. That's the title of one of the books about what the governments knew at that particular time. The Bermuda Conference was a complete failure. No strategies were developed out of that conference that ever led to the rescue of any of the Jews of Central and Eastern Europe. Within a month of that conference, the Warsaw Ghetto was completely liquidated. Himmler decreed that all of the ghettos in all of the occupied zones were to be liquidated, and more mass deportations and death ensued. I mention these particular historical benchmarks in the Nazi era, and I'm, I'm very much aware that in doing so, it would make the Holocaust be some sort of an abstract historical lesson, another moment in human history. In fact, the Nazi destruction of European Jewry happened according to a carefully contrived plan, and it represented the culmination of centuries of hatred and unrestrained prejudice. It happened to the Jewish people. It happened to individuals and families solely because they were Jewish. Today there are, and in the future there will be more, people who deny the reality of the Nazi destruction of European Jewry. And that's a great concern to me. We can talk about the history, we have the record, out of respect for the survivors and those who did not survive, succeeded in leaving records of what they experienced, I'd like to turn from a more abstract reporting of the history, which you can get from any book. I mean, there are dozens of really fine historical reference works about the Nazi era. But I'd like to turn from this kind of a presentation to a more personalized eyewitness account of what happened during the Holocaust. A million five thousand children died during the Nazi destruction of European Jewry. Their deaths defy comprehension. Infants were literally snatched from their mother's arms and smashed against pillars or impaled on bayonets. Trainloads of children were delivered to Auschwitz, and no one blinked an eye or made an effort to stop. When you go into the main administration building at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, Yad Vashem being 
the israeli government's holocaust research and memorial center there is a a painting by a survivor of a child who had been smashed against a pillar and left dead herman graby whom i mentioned earlier graby was assigned by the reich railroad administration and the tote organization to work in the ukraine Grady was a very loyal and very proud German who had no idea what his government was doing in those regions. Grady watched his co-nationalists smash babies against walls. Mr. Grady became a Nazi-era rescuer, ultimately either saving or extending the lives of some two to 3,000 Jewish people Polish peasants residents, and underground people in the Ukraine. Three years ago, a year before his death, Herman Graby was present while I was speaking a bit about his experiences. And it happened that there was a, a representative of the neo-Nazi American movement uh, in the audience who challenged the veracity of Herman Graby's story, but not having any realization that Herman's in the audience. Herman Graby got up, and this, this is a man who had his first heart attack in 1942 while saving Jews in, in Zorbunov and Ravno and Dubno, and who at this point had had 17 heart attacks, got up and sought that man out and demanded, now Grady had a way with his finger, he was always shaking his fingers in somebody's nose shook his finger in this man's nose and demanded to know how dare he him as a liar and, and said to him, you are saying what I saw I did not see? Well, there are those who would like to say that children were not smashed or impaled, that families were not rounded up and murdered in, in the outlying areas and, and left by train tracks and, and all the rest of that. The Jews really did not lose their property, that for their security they were moved to non-war related zones. That's what the revisionists would like us to believe today. In fact, mothers and children and entire families were machine gunned in forests, gassed in camps throughout Europe, and world leaders knew about it but did nothing. An interesting antidote, it, it, uh, 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 no, uh, an interesting story, not an antidote, I wish it were. Uh, an interesting story uh, from Elie Wiesel. In 1976, Carter was in the process of establishing the United States Holocaust, well, what would be called the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, then the Presidential Commission on the Holocaust. And Car Carter wanted Elie Wiesel to be the president of that, and Wiesel said no. He apparently wanted to uh, have no more to do with bricks and, and mortar monuments. He wanted something different, an, an authentic response. And at that point, the mandate of the presidential commission to build a monument in Washington and a, a place where people could gather. Wiesel didn't want that. You have to understand that from 1945 until 1976, the United States government denied having any direct certifiable information about the activities in the extermination camps. Jimmy Carter ordered the Central Int Agency, which is now the repository and guardian of the military intelligence records of the Second World War, Carter ordered the CIA to produce a, a full set of U.S. Army air surveillance photographs of Auschwitz while Auschwitz was working, and to have those delivered to Elie Wiesel in exchange for his becoming the president of the Presidential Holocaust Commission. Wiesel accepted the photographs and didn't release them. Late in 1976, our government, having for that whole period denied the existence of those photographs or knowledge of what was going on in that camp in 1944 at a time when the camp was dispatching the lives of 10,000 Jews a day. Carter handed over those pictures and asked Wiesel why he didn't release them to the press. And then the Carter administration released them on their own. The governments knew. They had good knowledge of what was going on. We claimed that we could not send airplanes in to bomb the railroad tracks. 
And yet we could send surveillance planes in. It's an anomaly. It doesn't make sense. We knew and we did nothing. Before, yes? Right. Yes. In case you couldn't hear that, the point is that we were bombing. Uh, there were there were bombing raids up to the factories related to the camps, and yet the camps were not railroad lines beyond were not seen to be relevant to those particular bombing missions. Right. Right. But you would want to study the U.S. Uh, economic relationship, for example, to the IG Farben works or that if you wanted to understand why we didn't go all of the way and, and destroy those railroad tracks. Maybe we would not have <laughs> saved the lives of Jewish people, but we certainly would have made it very easy for that government to continue its work in an efficient manner, which is what they were interested in. Before going to their death, some of the children left incredible legacies in poems, paintings, and diaries. Perhaps you're familiar with them. If you're not, you should be. By the end of the day, you will be. Pavel Friedman, who was aged 15, had a poem that is recorded in one of the most powerful and meaningful columns of poetry and paintings left from a particular camp, Treasonstadt. And the collection is entitled, I Never Saw Another Butterfly. Perhaps you're familiar with it. I quote this person who did not survive but left the legacy. For seven weeks I have lived here, penned inside this ghetto, but I have found my people here. The dandelions call to me, and the white chestnut can in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last. Butterflies don't live in here. Another child wrote, Do not cry at this report. At the station, another girl I saw, about five years old. She fed her younger brother, and he, he was sick. Into a diluted bit of jam, she pressed a tiny crust of bread and skillfully inserted it into his mouth. This my eyes were privileged to see, to see this mother a mother of five years feeding her child, to hear her soothing words. She wiped his tears with a smile, injecting joy into his heart, this little child of Israel. They were consumed by frost, starvation, and lice. Why in days of doom are they the first victims of wickedness, the first in the trap of evil, the first to be detained for death, the first to be thrown into the wagons of slaughter. At age 14, Elie Wiesel entered Auschwitz, and this is his testimony, written ten years later. Men to the left, women to the right. Eight words, spoken softly, quietly, indifferently, without emotion, Eight short, simple words. Once inside of Auschwitz, Elie saw what those words meant. Not far from us, flames were leaping from a ditch, gigantic flames. They were burning something. A lorry drew up to the pit and delivered its load. Little children, babies. Yes, I saw it. I saw it with my own eyes, those children and the flames. Never shall I forget that the first night in camp, which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never shall I forget the smoke. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into wreaths of smoke beneath a silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames which consumed my faith forever. 
Never shall I forget that nocturnal silence, those moments which murdered my God and my very soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I forget these things. There is a difference between a recitation of the historical and the eyewitness account. Herman Graby, who became a Nazi-era rescuer, was approached by one of his staff workers, a Jew, who said to him, I must be excused. I have to go and find my family. A mobile killing unit had moved into the adjacent town and was doing its work immediately adjacent to one of uh, Graby's railroad organization's engineering projects. Graby, hearing the man's accusations, said, you're wrong. Our government would never do that. And sent the man back to his work, and Graby took his car and drove to the next town, a distance of probably five, six, seven miles, to find, in fact, that there was a mobile killing unit work behind his project at the airport. A large mass grave had been dug. The dirt was mounded. Behind the dirt, Jewish people were being brought in by truckloads, forced to undress. Clothing was being stacked according to style of clothing, gender, very neatly, very orderly. And then people were forced to wait. Beyond mass grave, there were people, Germans, Ukrainian militia, Hungarian militia, who took their turns. A guard would call out, next 10. The next 10 people would walk around, stand by the edge of the mass grave, and they would be shot, and they would fall into the grave on top of the 10 who preceded them. Didn't matter whether they were dead or not. What mattered is that they were shot, and the mass grave would be covered. Graby watched as a family of ten lined up. He assumed they were a family. You'll recall this testimony. It is recorded in more than a hundred books in fourteen languages. It was Graby's testimony which opened the Crimes Against Humanity section of the trial at Nuremberg. Graby recounts how he watched an old man caressing the head of his ten-year-old son. The boy was crying, and the old man was trying to soothe the boy. Beyond them was a grandmotherly figure who was cradling a child and scratching it under the chin, trying to relieve the tension, the moments waiting. Gravy watched the old man leaned over, still stroking the boy's head, whispered something and pointed to the heavens. The old man and the boy looked, and at that moment, the guard called, next ten, quickly, quickly, and they went, and they were shot, and they died. The next morning, Grady came back to that work site very early, 4.30 fuck in the morning, and it had only been partially covered over, and some of those people who had not died in the mass grave had pulled themselves out were sitting on the edge, covered with blood, nearly frozen. Gravy watched as some of them began to walk off to the forest, and then a detachment of Nazi soldiers arrived, and the Jews began to run. The guards jumped out with the militiamen and began and killing those few who had managed to get out. In 1984, Herman Gravy was telling me that story. I was preparing his autobiography, his biography. Um, and in telling me the story, it, it just caused him to relive everything. And, and he was 83 years old at that time, and weep and, and sob. And we just stopped what we were doing and went to the kitchen and, and had something to drink and, and just tried to get out of the, the scene. And, he began to cry at the table, and, and it was, it was, I just had to ask, you know, what, what was going on? Why, 
What was he remembering? What was the pain that was coming to him at that moment? Because it was so much a part of his humanity. I maybe, how did you know that they man was an old man. Rabbi said, oh, he wasn't old. He was my age. He just looked old because he was sick. He obviously hadn't eaten. How did you know then that the boy was 10 years old? I didn't know. But my own son, Friedel, was back 12 miles away, visiting with my wife. And he's gone. And then Grabe, almost in a whisper, pointed up to the roof of his house, as he had described at Nuremberg, and he said, I know exactly what I would have said to my son at that moment. I would have said to my son, don't be afraid, because where we're going, there are no mass graves, no SS, no militia. That's part of the history. That is the history of the Nazi destruction of European Jewry. I want to tell you a, another story. It's, it's another historical account. It, it looks at the Holocaust from a very different angle. The Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court six years ago, Moshe Besky, asked a question about those people. What enabled them to do what they did? But why were there so few of them? Why only four or five thousand, now some six thousand, out of all of the people, millions in the populations of Central and Eastern Europe, why were there so few who would save Jewish people, who would form the resistance? I wanted to know the answer to that question myself. I felt I had to know it. I am a Christian. I, I come from German, Dutch stock. I needed to know. Now, my own ancestors, where were they? What were their roles? And I ended up pursuing the whole question of what enabled the Nazi-era rescuers to do what they did. But let me tell you the story that got me into it. 1976, I was on a sabbatical studying in Poland, East Germany, and in Israel at Yad Vashem. When I arrived at Auschwitz with my, well, uh, when I arrived in Krakow with my credentials, I was basically a day ahead of schedule. And, decided rather than present those credentials that I would go to Auschwitz for my own personal spiritual reasons. I had brought a copy of Elie Wiesel's book, Night. I was reading it where I could when you know, where most of, of what he describes had, had occurred. I got there on a holiday and there were no public buses. The hotel arranged a taxi cab for me and in the course of the transit from Krakow to Auschwitz, the taxi cab driver inquired about my reasons for going there, what was it about, and I explained to him. When we got to the camp, he, he, and what I can only interpret to be a very caring, considerably bigger than this one, the film, and at that point I'd been teaching Holocaust studies at the University of Oregon for four years, and I thought I'd seen all the films. The films that are shown there, at least at that time, and I assume they're still shown, an amalgamation. The first sequence of films were by Nazi cinematographers of the camp in action. The second sequence of films were by the Soviet liberation forces. The third sequence was Allied liberation pictures. And of course, the, the pictures are just horrible. It shows everything that was going on from the beginning to the end. The taxi cab driver sitting next to me was sobbing through the whole film. It turns out to be the first time he'd ever seen it. And he, he just, it was beyond him. As you leave that auditorium, there is a large aluminum sign. And in five languages, languages it, it tells the visitor, leave here in silence. Be still. Go, but don't speak. About five or six rows in front of us as we walked out were some people who began speaking in German. The cab, taxi cab driver took off after them and cursed them in English and German and Polish. Everybody knew exactly what his feelings were. And then he disappeared. And at the end of the day, he looked me up. He found me. I went on about my business, figuring that I'd find a way back somehow. But he found me. And he wanted to tell me a story to a member of his family in order to explain his outburst. 
And he did. The story he told me was of his sister, a very devout Roman Catholic woman who was a nurse. And her job was to go into the Krakow Jewish ghetto, to go in there every day, to check people, to look for people who were sick, who might be carrying a disease that could run through that entire population and wipe out what was to be a major labor column for the railroad administration. Every day she went in, and every day, if there were sick people, she made a report. And she had been told by the German regional government that those people who were identified by name and by number and by address, that they would be taken to hospitals and sanitariums until they recovered. In fact, they were being taken away and killed in the forests outside of town, off the rails. And she discovered that and decided that she had no choice but to establish a rescue network. What she decided to do was take Jewish children out of the ghetto and deposit them with her family and friends in the farming regions around Krakow, Poland. How do you get children out of that ghetto? She was a very tall person, and her uniform had a large hooped dress. And what she decided to do was take those children out of the ghetto between her legs. She removed layers of hooping, and she would literally spend a week with each child, teaching them to walk, bent over between her legs, with their arms around her legs, hands on her thighs, and she would practice walking back and forth and right and left until the child could anticipate her movements and not stumble or betray the child's existence underneath her dress. Now, this whole thing was complicated by the fact that she had to go past the first checkpoint, which was staffed by militia, and to the second checkpoint, which was staffed by the German regional command and the militia, file her report and walk off. You can imagine the tension with the first child. She got past the first station. The second station she stopped, handed in her papers, and continued walking. And Adjacent to this area, though I've never seen it, I don't know what it looks like, apparently there was a park. And what she would do is slip into the park, sit down, and the child would slip out from between her legs, and the two of them would walk off together. Now, she had to have some place to take the children, so she, as I said, went to her family and friends in the farming region, and they would take the children. No problem. And she told them what to say. If anybody asks, this is my, my brother's child, and they're from this town close to the war zone, and they sent the child here, it was a logical strategy, and it worked. She went to her priest. She was, as I said, a devout Roman Catholic, told the priest what she was doing, asked for baptismal certificates. He said, no. He said, I won't tell them what you're doing, but I will it with you. So she did it anyway. She got 12 children out of that ghetto, 12 children. One day she took a child that she believed to be dying of tuberculosis, a very sick child. With only practice for the morning, she started walking the child out. They got past the first guard post. At the second guard post, the child began to cough. The accumulation of fluids in the child's lung bent over the child couldn't catch his breath and began to cough. A guard heard it, a, a militiaman heard it, ran up without a word, no command, hit her in the side of the head with the butt of his rifle, and knocked her to the ground, exposing the child. It, it happened all so fast. With no command, the rest of the guards around them and grabbed the child and held the screaming child upside down by the legs and with no command, shot the child to death, and then shot her to death, and ordered that the two bodies remain there for three days as a warning to anyone else who would help the Jews of the Krakow ghetto. And you know the history of the Holocaust. There were no successful escapes or rescues in the Krakow ghetto. The whole ghetto was eventually liquidated, more than 5,000 Jews, her 12 children, lived. She died. I had to know what was behind that. What was, what was behind all that? What allowed it to happen? 
That's another story. I'll come back another time. You'll hear some of that later. Uh, I'm getting the signal that it's close to the end of time. Um, I was afraid I wouldn't have enough to say to you today. What I would like to, to do in closing probably has little to do with the topic that has been assigned to me by uh, Bob Harris. And I hope you will forgive me for not following your mandates directly. I want to go back and conclude with um, an observation, personal opinion, uh, if you want to, to call it such, based on the Frank Stangle incident. I, I think it's important to say, and I, I I do this whenever I'm teaching at the seminary, whenever I taught at the University of Oregon, whenever I teach, I, I, I conclude with this. Learned people, physicians, people who are supposed to be healers, went to Judah and taught a madman. Unfortunately, he really wasn't a madman. He was just an Austrian traffic cop with a wife and kids at home. They taught him how to become an effective killer, how to kill Jews, more of them faster. And one begins to stop and ask the question, which is basic to any study of Holocaust, whether it's history or literature or morality and ethics. It could not be without the active complicity of learned persons, physicists and physicians, chemists and psychologists and community organizers, without sociologists and theologians, all of us in, in the learned community are responsible for what we do with our knowledge. It can be put into the service of humanity or in the service of death. And the choice is always ours, always. Now, I'm a preacher by trade. You can probably gather that from the way this thing's ending. <laughs> There's this wonderful line in Deuteronomy where Moses is about to break company with the community. And God says to Moses, tell them to make a choice. Life or death, curse or blessing. Tell life. And the academic community, given the privilege of our knowledge and experiences, our awareness of history, are called to choose life blessing rather than curse. And the folks then didn't understand the meaning of that. They didn't know how to do it, and they didn't do it. And now it's up to us to try to reclaim that by the way we use our knowledge. Again, it has been a great privilege to be with you, and I thank you very much. something that we're carrying on, something that we think, and at that time we will continue the conversation. So what I would like to invite you to do is to get in groups of five or six and to process what kinds of things came up for you. How did you hear what was said? What did it do for you? What kinds of questions remain for you? And for about 15 minutes, in these small groups, do that, and then we'll report and we'll have a seat. Our speaker will say some more. So can you do that for about 15 minutes? So what you heard. And so would uh, this group, would someone like to say what came out of your group and what? feelings that it brought up with me were that um, I thought that everything I'd read everything I'd been told, that nothing could shock me anymore and nothing surprises me and then hearing it today it shocked me again and since these people are just a few years older than us um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they told us what, hap what happened to them or what was going on with them at the time and um, 
some were in other countries and some were writing to the government and petitioning and you know nothing was done and feeling of helplessness and you know just how shocking it is What would your group like to say? Well, what we came up with was that one of the important things for us to remember is for us to tell our own kids and other people that we deal with in the future about what happened in the past, and it's important for us to learn from the past. It was brought out by one of the members of the group that during that time, a lot of reporting was done about people were saying, but there was nothing in regards to the J Jewish people of Europe. Little. All right. About this group. I guess I'm. Um, I don't think you really even need this. I don't think it's helping. to speak rather than our groups, and most specifically, <laughs> you started to address an area that was of great concern to you when you went over there as to why there weren't more involved in the resistance, what <coughs> made them get involved, and uh, what they did. And we all agreed that you didn't seem to have enough time to complete that, com that thought. Well, go ahead. Excellent point there. How about this group? Who would like to speak to this group? Well, I think our group, uh, uh, we, we discussed very briefly uh, denial. We're facing denial in our own country that when it comes to impoverished people, um, people who need help, uh, we turn a deaf ear. We're told by the government that uh, 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 employment is up and there really aren't uh, homeless people that they choose to live this way. I mean, we 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 get comfort in denial. All right. Nobody else brings that up to use. Uh, Betty's from Hawaii, and I'm uh, not from any place special all over. Here. <laughs> uh, and uh, the question was asked of us: uh, Why are you here? You know. <laughs> Uh, why, uh, why do two uh, wandering Catholics come in and listen to uh, stories about Holocaust? And, uh, I didn't really have a great answer. I didn't think. I, I feel that we're in the midst of a real spiritual crisis in our country right now, that uh, there's a tremendous lack of sensitivity to the disenfranchised, to... Uh, the poor, there's a over-focus on, on materialism that, that is disappointing. Uh, the candidates that I see lining up at the trough for Super Tuesday don't impress me as the type of feet have the least bit of interest in a spiritual quality to any problem or an ethical. Ethical issues are totally absent from the entire discussion that we have. We have little uh, 
little comedies for our politicians to play and I've yet to hear anybody talk about anything as serious and profound as this horrible thing that happened. So that's, I, I'm here to be made sensitive to something that I feel is fundamental to being human. How about this group? I would like to make a comment to the question, why are you here? Uh, the question should be, why aren't you here, perhaps? Going back to what the Henry David Thoreau at one time, after one demonstration when he was in jail, a friend came and said, what are you doing there? And he said, no, the question is, what are you doing there, out there, not with me? Our little group had a discussion, and maybe we took a different line of thought that the world, you mentioned about the trains going within three months of the factory. How many people in the world control the whole world? And whether the, when they meet down in Rio up here and every summer, are getting together and deciding what's going to happen in, in the year. That the bonds, the, the stocks that they buy and the money that they're making is more important than all of humanity. And it makes me feel very uneasy about the whole world because it's still doing that. People in other countries are coming in and buying stocks in our country and how do you know they will not control something like this happening again? And then they may choose the Jews because it's an easy way to get the people's mind off the fact that they're making money on us. And it's deeper than just the, the power and the money that controls the world. And we, we, we have to first get rid of war, and then we have to get rid uh, We must know what's happening. They may still control us, but at least we not, must not be stupid about it. You must know that it's the money and the power that's ruling. And we must work wherever possible to break this, if we can. All right? That's what we discussed. The speaker has heard the different kinds of things that have been important to the group, and so you can speak to those in any way that you care to. <laughs> I think more than anything else, I would, I would affirm what you're struggling with and say that, that these are the right things for us to be struggling with, and we should be doing it together. Uh, we're not going to do it alone. If one tells, holo tells Holocaust-related stories, studies this kind of history, you have to be very careful with it because it has the potential of, of wiping out your own commitment to life. It's very easy to become cynical and despairing. And I think we have to be very caught. That. Cynicism is not something that I want to encourage. Suspicion, yes. Distrust of those in power, most often, yes. But not cynicism, not despair. You know, I, I will no longer do Holocaust-related classes and lectures without including something about Nazi-era rescuers. We have to know that there was a faithful remnant of moral, caring, helpful, humane, egalitarian people 
in the world. And it's a faithful remnant in our traditions that, that always carry the day. A small group of people that hang on to their values, who, to borrow another Thoreau-type uh, phrase, march to the tune of a different drummer. That's what counts. And we've, we've got to remember those people and empower that side of ourselves and that in other people. Your question. That's right. That's right. You protest, and you protest, and you protest, and you don't be silent about it, and you don't pretend like it's not happening. That's Wiesel's powerful town beyond the wall. There was that character in the window, and he watched all of us line up and didn't do a thing. The eternal spectator. He pretends like it's not happening when it is. We can't pretend. But then we mustn't be that frightened of, of death with a capital D. I mean, when we resist, we resist because we're in favor of life. End of sermon. <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> How did you hear what uh, they had heard? Was it what you intended to say? It, it was what I intended to say. It's what I hoped I would evoke, but I also heard a lot of pain. And from where I was standing, I saw tears. And I feel the pain and I feel the tears. And I'm not going to give in to either one. It hurts. Yes. Yeah. The, the book is entitled The Moses of Ravno. It's about Herman Graby. He was the man I described to you. I mean, he was a German. He shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have done what he did. Why did he do it? I mean, and it, it's just the story of, of his life from 1933 to about 1950. And it's the account of one person who didn't give in to the, the authority, to the power, who didn't turn his back. He saw what I described, and that led him to take a, a, a vow, to make a covenant to save the lives of Jewish people. Uh, the Moses of Ravno is, is it's really just a, a drop in the moment of history. And yet, without Herman Graby, the three that he took out on his own train wouldn't be alive today. And the thousands of people who came to him wouldn't have lived or at least had their lives extended had he not figured out how to forge passports and lie and create false companies and do all kinds of things in order to protect life. There's a book called Schindler's List yes. by Thomas Keneally. Yeah, right. Another German industrialist, Another right? German industrialist. He exactly. Was a, he was a Czech. Um, Schindler, yeah, Schindler. yeah. But he was working for the German government in their administration. Well, yeah. While we're gonna, while you're talking about, Alice Springer will be here for one of our panels. He too is a rescuer and uh, is an industrialist rescuer. Right. You know him. Or yes. Oh, Springer is wonderful. What a what a person. I mean, he. You'll just get caught up with his stories. It, it, listening to Otto Springer talk is is like uh, reading a a model a novel. Yes. Well, I think it's it's very important that the word you said is not not be in complete disagreement with anything that you said about Thoreau. And not all of us can do the same thing. I, I think it's very important for each person to do what it is. Now, I write two letters a month to congressmen and senators, mostly about one piece. I get back a lot of form letters, and lots of times I get so discouraged. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why am I doing this? And, and yet, I keep doing it because I feel, and I've written letters to the other two states, I must do something. Uh, I have a granddaughter. I want her to live to grow up. Uh, it, it's as simple as that. And uh, I see, you know, the, the prime risk to all of us is this movie that I wrote. I agree. Although sometimes it's very easy to get very cynical and despairing and, and go on and on and on. And, 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 
Let, take one more, and then I'll come back to that. Yes, uh, Bernie. Where can your book be uh, purchased? I hope. <laughs> Dodd Mead is, is, has really been distributing it. If you can't find it or order it at a local bookstore, I can get you a copy. And I think that there are copies floating around here and there. Yes? When I was reading The Fundamentalist, it found the um, response that Dr. Craig Wolfer gave in terms of getting the Do you want me to respond to that question in terms of the fundamentalists or just in general? Both would be nice. All right. The question is about the response of, of the, the churches to the Holocaust and what they're teaching and what they're doing with that information presently. Um, on the fundamentalist side, I, I'm very concerned. Um, I was down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for their Religion and Life. They still have that in Louisiana. Religion and Life Week on the Louisiana State University campus. And of course, Jimmy Swigert's um, <laughs> operation is there. And you'll remember that Jimmy Swigert is the one who on national, if not international, television held up a picture of, of the end results of Auschwitz and said, this is what the Jews get for killing Jesus. Now, I mean, madness. That is absolute, offensive, untrue madness. Do you know Robertson? Pat Robertson? No, I don't know Pat Robertson's position on it. He's trying to get elected. So <laughs> I mean, if that tells you anything, you know, swaggers. Well, anyway, we'll, um, I took that on in a public forum. And, and Swigert, the next day, had three of his people in the audience to, to say that that's not really what he meant, that it was a far more general statement. So fundamental Christianity is kind of waffling between the Jews got what they deserved and we need Israel and we're going to be friends with Israel because without the Jews in control of Israel, our end of time theology will never come true. So I'm real leery about fundamentalists. I get nervous around them for that reason. I mean, Jews are, are really a vehicle for whatever, yeah, or their justifications. <laughs> right, of course. Now, you gotta watch out for the liberal spectrum for very similar reasons. They will use the Holocaust. I, I've just gotten out of a, a, what has felt like a six month long argument with a, a contemporary in Marin County who wrote a letter to the editor and said to the community that what's happening to the Palestinians is directly equipped to what happened to the Jews in Germany and Poland. Well, I mean, that, that's not only untrue, it is patently offensive, and it doesn't help the cause of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. So, you know, and he's as liberal as they come. So the, the, the church is struggling with all of this stuff. But the church has never taken it on and looked at it firsthand, and, and, and never asks the question, how did we set the fertile soil for all of this to There's a few Catholic theologians, a few Protestants, a few Orthodox, who dare to ask those questions. It's, it's a big problem when they start asking those questions. Because the minute you get to Easter, the minute you get to Good Friday, you have to teach your lessons very differently. You have to preach differently. They don't know how to do that. When I teach at the seminary, I try to inform people as to how you can do that. It's a tough one for Christians. Because in America, we don't sense ability for that. We went to war to, to get rid of the Nazis, and we, we don't look at, at how our own tradition became the fertile soil for all that. Yes? In line with that, one of the things that you said earlier I found quite shocking in a way, that the, I guess, the, the, one of the heads of these extermination groups that you were talking about was a Lutheran minister. That's right, with a PhD. PhD, and he, and he found his activity appropriate, you Consistent said? with. Consistent with. And I found that extremely shocking, and I, I, I just don't understand it. What you want to do is go back and, and read the writings of, of Martin Luther. For example, if you, if you look at Luther's treatment of the Jews, they, they were really, he just, he didn't, he had no use for Jews. When 
when Germans were arrested and held on six-month detentions for protesting Reich policy between 1933 and 1936, when they were put in jail, very often they found two books in the jail with them. One was a Bible and the other was a copy of a Martin Luther tract against the robbing, raving hordes, which was a diatribe against the Swabian peasants, written by Luther in 1546. And the issue in that document was conformity to the rule of the state, the landowners. And of course, the message was very clear, very clear. Don't resist the National Socialists. We are installed and, and operate under this same principle that Luther is pur purporting in this Swabian Peasant Revolt document. It, certainly this one Lutheran minister isn't Lutheranism, and he's not representative of all the Lutheran clergy in, in Germany. He was representative of the Reich's Bishop Mueller. He was, he, he was installed over von Vodelsfang and the rest of them. So, I mean, you, you struggle with that. But yeah, solution was the same, destroy them. There was, it's a no-win situation. That, that message was heard by many people who wanted to hear it, who were looking for their own justifications. If there's a warning to any of us, you know, it, it is that we pay attention, very close attention, to our own biases, our bigotries, our prejudices. I mean, Hitler isolated homosexuals, dissidents, Catholics, anybody that didn't agree. And, and, and they were persecuted, if not murdered. You know, there was nobody going around checking the prejudices and the biases. In terms of, of this group, I'm, I'm very tempted to spend the next couple of hours, but you have a group of people coming who will talk a bit about their involvement as rescuers. Let me say to you that the, the Nazi-era rescuers had a number of things in common. And I have interviewed now a larger population. First and foremost, Nazi-era rescuers had articulately moral parental role models. One or both parents served as their role model. Second, they were people who were risk takers. They were adventuresome, but they took risks Anyway, I mean, they, they looked at the risks, they were adventuresome, and, and they tried to, to, to look at the risks in order to minimize danger, so they'd, they'd accomplish what they wanted. One of the Nazi-era rescuers was a, a Seventh-day Adventist who became such after uh, five generations of Dutch Calvinism, and he was at a, at a Seventh-day Adventist school at the base of the Al Alps. And he set up a rescue network taking people, Jewish people, over the Alps and linking them up to other Seventh-day Adventists who railroaded them on out. Now, this man was a proficient, award-winning skier. He was just one of the best. John Wiedner, you may have heard of him. He was honored in San Francisco a couple years ago. To me, putting sticks on your feet and going through slush is madness. Um, I can't, I obviously can't do it, uh, or I, maybe I wouldn't think of it as madness. Wiedner. Wiedner would ski the route that he would take the next morning with the Jewish refugees. And he would ski it at night in order to see if Vichy or Nazi snow troops had moved into his area. Now, it's craziness to ski it at night. I mean, it's bad enough in the daytime. And <laughs> I was talking to Wiedner. I said, why did you do this? He said, it would have been wrong for me to further endanger, to put at risk those who are already so persecuted and suffering so much. He took his risks based on his adventuresome spirit and what he could do in order to minimize. Nazi era rescuers, for the third, are, are socially marginal. Now, social scientists just have a fit with that term. I don't, forgive me. <laughs> um, it, it's a really tough one to measure, so I call it religiously inspired nonconformity. <laughs> That is a euphemism to, to, to trip up everybody in, in, in sociology and in theology. Let me give you just one quick example of, of religiously inspired generality. I was interviewing a Dutch woman who rescued 40 people. She was just this incredible person, 82 years old when I was, when I was with her and doing these interviews. And 
on a, on a questionnaire, when you're interviewing people formally, you, you have six or seven ways of asking why without asking why. And she didn't answer why in any of those cases. I mean, I just couldn't get her to tell me about her motivation. What got her going in this? So the recorder was off. We were having a cup of coffee. I said, why would you do this? She must have known that I went to one of those seminaries where they don't teach you to memorize passages. Um, I, I'm not a fundamentalist. Um, and she looked at me and she said, well, you know what Paul teaches in Romans 12, too? And she let it hang there. <laughs> I said, no, what did Paul teach in Romans 12, too? <laughs> be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by your mind. If I betrayed or killed Jews, I would conform to this world. And I knew I could not do that. I had to be transformed. And so I saved Jews. And she did, 40 of them. A little side story on this. This woman kept looking at her wristwatch. And we'd been interviewing almost six hours at this point, six straight hours of interviews. And she was encouraging me to go on. And I was saying, finally, why do you keep looking at your wristwatch? She said, well, this has been a wonderful experience for me. Now, she'd only been there two days. She had a full week. She had just been honored at Yad Vashem the day before. She had honors in Tel Aviv at a kibbutz. She was being reunited with the people she saved and their children and grandchildren who wouldn't have existed without her. Another week to go, and, and she was looking at her watch and saying, this is all so wonderful, but you know, I really need to get back to my kirk in Amsterdam. Why do you need to get back to your church? Because I'm in charge of refugee resettlement, and today, tomorrow, we are going to be bringing two families off the South China Sea and putting them into our congregation. Forty years later, she's still doing the same things. You know, they're not, in, they're not in death camps now. They're coming off the South China Sea. There's a consistency. Write all your letters. Who cares what kind of junk responses you get? At least you know who not to vote for next time. <laughs> and you, know, you, you can't give in. You still do what you do. You're trying. Another thing that the Nazi era rescuers had in common was empathic imaginations. The ability to put themselves in the place of another person and ask the question, what would I want someone to do for me? Herman Graby, the situation there with the, the old man and the boy, 10-year-old, it's the empathic imagination at work. Yes? The overwhelming majority were religious people. But I could not find any one intellectual, emotional response them to do it. The thing that I've concluded is that the rescuers were people who had the skills, and they had a value, an overarching value, that said human suffering, when it's imposed in this fashion, is wrong, and I cannot tolerate it, and I am responsible. I am responsible. Right. But they had the skills to go with a sense of responsibility. If they didn't have the skills, they couldn't have done what they did. They sought have done it. Many of them lost their lives trying. And we'll never know who they are. And because they were religious, they believed I'm my brother's keeper. Absolutely. That was their sense of responsibility. As a matter of fact, there was one Hungarian woman who kept saying that. I am my brother's keeper. I have no other choice. That's my moral duty. Yeah. Nazi era rescuers had a, a number of other things in common, um, and we just don't have the time today to, to go into all of this. To leave you with, with one thing. Your, your academics, your leaders in this community, several years ago, Rabbi Yitzhak Greenberg, in a, a teach-in Ellie, for Elie Wiesel at, uh, in, Washington, in New York City, concluded uh, his remarks on the building of a moral society with these words, and I, I leave them with you. They're very important words. He said, make no statement, theological or otherwise, that would not be credible in the presence of burning children. In the presence of burning children. Make no statement theological or otherwise, that would not be credible in the presence of burning children. That's the meaning of it. Thank you.